A reading from the first book of Samuel. All the elders of Israel came in a body to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Now that you are old and your sons do not follow your example, appoint a king over us, as other nations have, to judge us. Samuel was displeased when they asked him for a king to judge them. He prayed to the Lord, however, who said in answer, Grant the people's every request. It is not you they reject. They are rejecting me as their king. Samuel delivered the message of the Lord in full to those who were asking him for a king. He told them, The rights of the king who will rule over you will be as follows. He will take your sons and assign them to his chariots and horses, and they will run before his chariot. He will also appoint from among them his commanders of groups of a thousand and of a hundred soldiers. He will set them to do his plowing and his harvesting, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will use your daughters as ointment makers, as cooks, and as bakers. He will take the best of your fields, vineyards, and olive groves, and give them to his officials. He will tithe your crops and your vineyards, and give the revenue to his eunuchs and his slaves. He will take your male and female servants, as well as your best oxen and your asses, and use them to do his work. He will tithe your flocks, and you yourself will become his slaves. When this takes place, you will complain against the king whom you have chosen. But on that day, the Lord will not answer you. The people, however, refused to listen to Samuel's warning and said, Not so. There must be a king over us. We, too, must be like other nations, with a king to rule us and to lead us in warfare and fight our battles. Samuel had listened to all the people had to say. He repeated it to the Lord, who then said to him, Grant their request and appoint a king to rule them. The word of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Bless the people who know the joyful shout. In the light of your countenance, O Lord, they walk. At your name they rejoice all the day, and through your justice they are exalted. For you are the splendor of their strength, and by your favor our horn is exalted. For to the Lord belongs our shield, and to the Holy One of Israel, our King. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. 
Exio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he preached the word to them. They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him and after they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking to themselves. So he said, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, pick up your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Verbum Domini. I wanted to first make an announcement that this coming Sunday, EWTN is beginning a, a wonderful initiative. We are going to be televising Sunday Vespers with benediction at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. our local time here. I'd like to invite any people in the Birmingham area to join us here in this chapel. It's a beautiful way to close out Sundays with the official evening prayer, Vespers of the Church being prayed throughout the world by priests and religious and many lay people. And it would be a good way to learn uh, the divine office and to be able to pray that uh, evening prayer with us. So that will begin this coming Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Central Time. And we actually have the text that you, you can have, uh, download free at EWTN.com forward slash Vespers. So the texts are all there that we'll be using, the hymns and all of that will be there ewtn.com forward slash vespers, or if you want to get the actual divine office books, you can call our religious catalog department. There's a story I always like to, to tell to illustrate today's first reading where the Israelites, this is a pivotal moment in the books of Samuel, first and second Samuel, it's a pivotal moment because up until this time, God had chosen the Israelite nation to be his firstborn. And it was through them all the nations would be blessed. So they were his chosen people, a priestly people. And they would be led by God, by his prophets like Moses or his judges like Samuel. But now they're complaining, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. And Samuel's grieved at this request. And the Lord himself says, they're rejecting me. But give them what they want, what they want. And so uh, this is what happens, is that they are given a king to be other, like other nations. But I'll talk a little more about how God still right straight on crooked lines, even with this choice that they made. 
But the story I like to tell to illustrate this is a story that supposedly happened at Carnegie Hall in New York where a jazz trumpeter was going to be performing. And you know we live in a, an age where we have cell phones and most every parish has an announcement before, turn off your cell phones, turn off your cell phones. So I'm sure that they had that there at Carnegie Hall, but someone arrived late, they didn't hear the announcement and they left their cell phone on. So during the performance of this jazz trumpeter, somebody's cell phone goes off with this different melody that's going on. And everybody kind of glares at the person because you're supposed to have your cell phone off and you've interrupted this performance. But what the jazz trumpeter did is that he took that melody of the cell phone and he incorporated it into his performance. And so as jazz, you could, you'd have different melodies and it just kind of goes with the flow of, of things that he played it slow, he played it fast, he did different variations on this and the people were just delighted because something more wonderful had even happened through this bad incident that had happened, the jazz trumpeter was able to turn it into something that was even a delight. And the people were delighted that he could take this incident and he could turn it into something uh, beautiful. And so this is what God does too, is that here the Israelites are rejecting God as their leader. They're saying, we want to be like the other nations. So they're re rejecting really the point that they are to be this firstborn of all the nations, the chosen people through which God is going to bless all the peoples. But God says, give them the request, grant them what they want. And Pope Benedict had a, a good uh, interpretation of how God is not limited by our bad choices. He says the kingdom was a result of Israel's rebellion against God. The law was to be Israel's king, and through the law, God himself. But God yielded to Israel's obstinacy and so devised a new kind of kingship for them. So yes, they will have their king, and eventually that king would be King David, who would be anointed and King David would unite that kingdom. The 12 tribes would be reunited or be united in David. And so what, he is, what God is devising is now this kingship and it ultimately is going to be fulfilled the king, in the kingship of Jesus Christ and the new covenant. That God, yes, is going to rule his people, all nations in fact, <laughs> to the one who is both son of God and son of man, who is an heir, a descendant of King David, but he's also the son of God. And so Jesus, we celebrate at the end of a liturgical year, Christ the King. So this is how God is going to take that. He's, he's going to write straight on crooked lines. And Pope Benedict said, God does not have a fixed plan that he must carry out. On the contrary, he has many different ways of finding man and even of turning his wrong ways into right ways. The feast of Christ the King is therefore not a feast of those who are subjugated but a feast of those who know that they are in the hands of one who writes straight on crooked lines. <laughs> so that's something that should give us all hope, right? In the troubles of our life or even in the mistakes that we have made, the bad choices, the rejections that we have given God, that when we return to the Lord, he's still able to write straight on our crooked lines, that he's able still to bring good out of all things as Romans 8, 28 puts it. He turns all things to good for those who love him. That's what God is able to do. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Anthony of the Desert. He lived to be 105. 
was born around 251 in Egypt. And as a young man, he heard the gospel being preached. Go to the rich young man, Jesus had said, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And he felt like God was speaking right to himself because he had been pondering these things. And he enters the church and hears this gospel and it's like God is speaking right to him. This is what I'm asking you to do, Anthony. And so he sells this inheritance that he has of the property, this rich property that they had. And he goes and he seeks God. He seeks holy men. He wants to learn from them. And then he himself lives this life of solitude in the desert. And so he's been called, in fact, the father of monasticism. Um, St. Benedict himself was influenced by Anthony. St. Athanasius was a friend of St. Anthony's and he wrote a biography of St. Anthony. And so we learn a number of things about Anthony and his life. But I think it also raises the question, what is the reason for this kind of life that God calls some to? Not a great number, but some are called. Why are they called to live this life as a hermit in a monastery, to live a life just totally dedicated to God? And there's a number of reasons why I believe that God does this. Number one, it shows to us the reality of God's existence. God does exist. We live in a culture that often is rejecting that idea and just as embracing materialism, the here and the now, only what can be physically sensed and rejects the higher realities, the spiritual realities of God, of God's existence. So when he is calling some people to that sort of life, it's pointing to that truth that God exists. I often say that we religious and wearing our habits or priests and wearing their clerical, clerical garb were like this. Even without saying anything, we're saying God exists. Think of the higher things, the lasting things. Secondly, it shows us the need for prayer in our lives too. The need for solitude and silence. We live in such an overstimulated society where we have this constant barrage of noise. And it's not healthy psychologically for us to have this constant stimulation of our senses. And we can't hear God over the noise sometimes. So there's a need for us too, and that's what the monastic life points to, for us to have silence to have solitude, to listen to that still small voice like Elijah heard. That was when God was speaking, that still small voice. As uh, Anna Marie Schmidt used to say, that God is a perfect gentleman. He doesn't shout over other voices. We have to make that choice of entering quiet, solitude, silence so that we can hear him and we're seeking him we have our antenna up lord i'm listening i'm here i'm seeking you <clears throat> so monasticism points to that truth for all of us also the need for detachment that if we get so wrapped up in possessing and having and entertainment and pleasures and all of these things it's hard for us to grow in that life with God. And so Anthony, in going to that desert, he's showing us too that need for detachment. In fact, two of our orations for the mass today spoke of that. Our collect at the beginning of mass said, grant God that denying ourselves, we may always love you above all things. And our prayer over the offerings, grant that released from earthly attachments, we may have our riches in you alone. So what is that detachment that enables us to be more free, to be able to respond to God? 
Francis of Assisi didn't want possessions because he said, then you have to protect them. You've got to ensure that you know, you've got to do all these things. You've got to clean them. You got. I remember this friend of mine. She was her 80th birthday, and uh, uh, Rosalie Sacco. She's since gone on to her reward. But I was invited to her 80th birthday, and she said, "No gifts. I've got enough things to dust. You know, <laughs> so we got to take care of these things." But Detachment helps us then to be free so that we can respond more to God. God. And, and finally, it shows us that ultimately we are all alone before God. We're moving toward him or away from him. And Anthony in the desert, he saw each day as a new beginning. To begin again, each day was a new day. And I'd like to conclude with some of his beautiful words to us. These are words that Athanasius recorded in his biography of St. Anthony of the Desert that St. Anthony said. Wherefore, my children, let us not weary, nor think that we have been a long while toiling, or that we are doing any great thing. For our present sufferings are not to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Let us not look at the world or reckon we have made great sacrifices, for even the whole earth is but a small spot compared to the expanse of heaven. Though we had possessed it all and had given it all up, it is nothing to the kingdom of heaven. It is no more than a man's making little of one copper coin in order to gain a hundred gold pieces.